Hi, my name is Hannah Owens. I'm currently a postdoc at the Center for Macroecology, Evolution, and Climate at the University of Copenhagen. Today, I will be presenting a talk on extrapolations and how to measure them, which is an important consideration when you're doing model transfer. So the talk is really in two parts. The first is uh, explaining a little bit about extrapolations, uh, what they are. And the second part is on how to measure extrapolation. And I will cover some very common measurements, including multivariate environmental similarity, the most dissimilar variable, movement-oriented parity, and XDET. So first, extrapolation. What is it? So when you fit a model, you take a series of measurements, you build the model based on those measurements, uh, and, you come up with some and you come up with some equation or series of equations. So in this case, we have two measurements, A and B. Uh, the model would be the smooth line. Um, any area that is that falls on that smooth line but within the training data set, we call an interpolation. So basically, it's smoothing any responses you have between the two measurements. Anything outside your series of measurements that uh, is predicted by the model, we call extrapolation. So, so basically, the model is saying, based on the data you've given me, this is the likely response. So in this case, the extrapolation is to point D. There it is. In the case of ecological niche modeling specifically, uh, extrapolation refers to the transfer to environments outside those that are used to train the model. So in this case, you might have a model for a fox that was trained in a temperate forest habitat. If you then uh, ask the model to extrapolate into dry oak forest or the Sonoran Desert, um, it's going to need to do some extrapolation in order to predict whether uh, those environments would be potentially suitable for the fox. You might have uh, much drier habitats than those used to train the model or warmer or colder habitats. And so basically, based on the information you give the model, where is it going to predict that species to occur in the future? So there are two kinds of novel environments that we talk about when we talk about ecological niche models and projecting into novel environments. So in this case, we have a plot in environmental space with temperature on the x-axis and precipitation along the y. The filled-in dots are occurrences for a particular species of interest. Eta m is the set of environmental conditions that occur within the training region we used for the model. Eta g is the series of environmental conditions into which we might project our model. But you see two different kinds of points that are outside of eta m in this case. The first kind of points are areas where there are individual variable extrema. Uh, and we refer to these as strict extrapolation. So we have two points here, the plus signs. The first plus sign um, occurs outside of the temperature extrema that were used to train the model. So you see it's way out here um, at the low end of temperature, but it occurs within the range of precipitation that was used to train the model. Whereas in the second point, it occurs far outside the range of precipitation that was used to train the model, but it occurs within the range of temperature that was used to train the model. And this is the, most, the more simple kind of extrapolation to identify. The more difficult kind of extrapolation to identify is indicated by the stars. And these are areas where there are actually new combinations of variables. Uh, and we refer to this as combinatorial extrapolation. So that's saying, okay, um, this falls within the extrema that were used to train the model, but that particular combination of variables was not... Uh, given as a possibility to the model. Uh, and so especially in cases where you have variables that are highly correlated, it may be that um, this combinatorial extrapolation may cause issues for transferring your model into a novel habitat. I will note that um, this is one set of terminology, the terminology of Owens et al. 2013. Um, if you've come across the work of Mescaron et al. 2014 or other papers referring back to that, they use a different kind of terminology, so I wanted to cover those differences really quickly. Uh, so in the case of Owens et al. 2013, I said strict extrapolation. Those are these orange points here. Uh, Mescaron refers to that as type 1 novelty. 
uh, and for Owen's 2013 combinatorial extrapolation in Mescaran is referred to as type two novelty, and that's those stars. Um, and so you'll actually see this later on in the talk. Um, and I just wanted to be clear that these two sets of uh, terms refer to the same kinds of things, but I wanted to map those for you so that it's clear. So when do you encounter extrapolation? Um, by now, you've probably seen a bunch of different kinds of applications for niche models uh, to predict what's going to happen under different conditions. Um, so you might have different contemporaneous geographies. So you might train a model for round goby. This is round goby here in its native range and then use that model to predict where else that species might be able to invade uh, by projecting that model into North America. And this is a, a well-known invasive species in North America. But you might want to identify invasive potential, potentially. Uh, another possible example would be to train a model for a rare species uh, and then project it into additional habitats um, in order to do target sampling for that rare species. So where else might I find this rare species? Uh, the other kind of extrapolation is uh, predicting it into uh, different time periods. So either hindcasting, asking where was potentially suitable for this species in the past, or where is particularly potentially suitable in the future. Uh, so this is an example with uh, some fish species trying to project where they're going, where there is going to be suitable habitat under climate change in the future. You might ask yourself to what degree this sort of extrapolation is really an issue, especially with regarding forecasting um, into uh, time periods that are not that far into the future. And the answer is that they can really be quite different. So these maps are showing where uh, they're will be less analogous habitat in the future. So in all the cases of the maps, the cooler areas are areas that have future analogs. The hotter areas are areas that have uh, less and less similar habitat to that that occurs at the present day. Um, so A2 and B1 are different climate scenarios. Um, and then we have global, which is asking, okay, for a particular cell, uh, where it, is their analog habitat anywhere else in the world? Um, so you can see the Amazon is the area that uh, the Amazon, like basically the tropics are uh, going to lose analog habitat much more quickly uh, than the temperate zones. However, if you look at it with a 500 kilometer limit, um, so that's saying, is there an analog habitat within 500 kilometers of a particular cell, uh, the answer is much more dire. So especially for A2, which is a much more extreme climate change scenario, uh, many fewer things are going to have analog climates close by. So it's potentially a problem uh, for species. But also, um, even under B1, which is a much less extreme scenario, you can see, especially in the tropics, uh, analog habitats tend to disappear. So there are three options when transferring models to non-analog habitats. And so first I'm going to illustrate these uh, with a little drawing. Here I have some variable on the x-axis. Maybe it's temperature, salinity, um, precipitation, whatever you'd like. On the y-axis is suitability. So this is how suitable that particular variable is for the species. Within the dotted lines is eta m. If you watched my video on uh, the relation between theory and uh, model transfer, this looks familiar. But if you haven't, that's okay. What we mean by E to M is the range of uh, that variable that is accessible to the species that's within its M or training region. The black line is the model response. So we, that's what we know. But say you want to transfer your model into a region that has uh, variable values that go above those that are found within the training region. Again, the model has three main options. The first option when anticipating that response is to essentially
not anticipate that response, and we call that truncation. So that's what this orange line is. So in the case of truncation, it's saying, I don't know what happens above uh, the maximum of this particular value, so I'm not going to make any assumptions. We're just going to say that no value above that value is suitable. But in the case of this model, you can see that that probably is not terribly realistic, considering that suitability had been going up uh, quite a bit. So your next option is clamping. That's this purple line. So what that's saying is, okay, at this particular variable, say that maximum might be 10 degrees Celsius, um, every, every value above 10 degrees Celsius is going to be exactly the same amount suitable as 10 degrees Celsius. So of course, if I'm using temperature as my example, you can see the problem right away. If that temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius, which is boiling, it's not likely that that species is going to find that suitable as well. Um, but in some cases, for other variables, clamping may be perfectly reasonable. Our last option is extrapolation. And you can see the algorithm uh, fits that response based on what it knows about what happens within the training region. So according and so it extrapolates based on that algorithm. So you essentially just feed in your um, variable values above the point at which the model was trained, and that will give, and then it will output suitability. Um, but you don't have a lot of control over what happens uh, if you've already fit your model and your al and the algorithm that you're using is one that looks good to you. Here are those three options when transferring uh, written down again, so hopefully it's a little clearer. So truncation uh, means to, that you cut off suitability response at the limit of a training region. So truncation here. Clamping is when suitability remains continuous at the limit of a training region. So that's shown here. And then extrapolation uses the functions fitted by the algorithm to predict change in suitability outside the training region. So that extrapolation might go up, it might go down, it might uh, come somewhere in between. Um, it's, it can be rather hard to predict. And it may or may not have, a, it may or may not be more biologically realistic than clamping or truncation, depending on the nature of the variable you're using and the algorithm that you're using. So when we transfer these models into geography, um, I wanted to illustrate how those models can look very different. So in this case, um, this model was generated using Maxent. At the top, we have the training region for a, a species of flying fish. Um, so this model was trained in the tropics. Uh, and this is a species that occurs in the Indo-Pacific, so that's what you're seeing here. This, this is the east coast of Africa, Madagascar, Australia, and this is the west coast of the Americas. So uh, Baja California here, South America here. When I transfer that model to a worldwide uh, distribution, um, what we see when uh, I allow, or when I'm only using truncation, is that um, this area shown here, which is outside of the analog, uh, or out, does not have any analogous habitat to those that were used to train the model, gets truncated. So it's not saying anything. This area is now considered to be unsuitable for that species. When I use clamping instead, you can see that um, in this same problem area where there is a novel habitat, um, there's now a suitable habitat that goes up into that area, um, but at a but may or may not be biologically realistic. And then we can also do extrapolation. So again, our regular model up top, um, and then we see that this is very highly suitable habitat according to uh, the models. What you see here is uh, that there's been a lot of extrapolation um, in uh, the Baltic and also in the Black Sea. So that's saying that these are much more suitable habitats for the species than even its native range, which doesn't seem terribly realistic based on what we know. If these were areas that were so much more suitable uh, than the tropics, uh, we probably would have observed flying fishes there already, if they could get there. 
And so this is what a map looks like when we use both clamping and extrapolation. So it's extrapolating to the extent that it can. Um, outside of the training region, it's going to clamp the response. But it looks a little bit more realistic than the model using extrapolation only. By now you might be seeing that extrapolation can be a problem and we can actually have uh, some rather unrealistic uh, model extrapolations based on the nature of uh, the environments into which we are projecting the model. So how do we measure extrapolation? How do we predict where the models are going to fit potentially unrealistic responses and how to and communicate this information in our findings and interpret it. So one of the most common ways of doing it right now is to calculate the multivariate environmental similarity of each grid cell. So this is a method that was first introduced by Elleth et al. in 2010 in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. This is a map showing the multivariate environmental similarity surface. So this is for that same uh, model that I just showed you of flying fishes. What you do to calculate the multivariate environmental similarity surface is that for each cell in your transfer region, you calculate the similarity between that cell and the training region for each variable. So if you have six variables, you'll calculate six different uh, similarity values. And the MESS score of each cell is the minimum of these scores. So that's saying, okay, if temperature is much more extremely dissimilar uh, to the training region than any other variable, that's the one that we're going to use for the score. So in the case of this MESS map, um, cells with no negative values have no variable values that fall within those in the training region. So in this, on this map, all of the areas shown in blue have positive, uh, have positive mess values. Areas shown in white are uh, zero. And areas shown in warmer colors, so pinks and reds, are areas where there is, a lot, there is potentially a lot of extrapolation. So those are areas where the environments are extremely dissimilar from those that were used to train the model. And so the algorithm is most likely not going to be able to predict very realistically uh, to what degree these habitats might be suitable for the species. And the way that you implement these, um, there are two main ways uh, the first is that it's automatically done in Maxent anytime you do a model transfer. So anytime you do a model transfer, you're going to generate this mess map. Another option is to use the mess function in mod Eva in the mod Eva R package. Um, and there are many other functions as well. Uh, this is just one uh, that implements mess. Uh, related to mess, you also get um, this map that was also proposed by Elith et al. in 2010, which identifies areas of strict extrapolation. So again, uh, areas where the variables fall outside of those used in the training region. Um, and what it's doing is identifying which variable is the most distant from the training region data set. So it's basically saying, okay, which variable is it that uh, drove the MESS score to be the score that it is? So in this case, um, most of this area is dark blue. So that's saying that there's no strict extrapolation anywhere in here, which is not terribly surprising because this is all tropical habitat uh, that was used to train the model. Uh, you see a few areas of SST range being the variable that drove things. So that's sea surface temperature range. Um, SST mean, uh, so that's mean sea surface temperature is mostly what's driving mess down here. Um, again, this is the coast of Antarctica, so you would expect that's really cold water, and so it's not surprising that that's outside of the realm of a species that was trained in the tropics. Uh, and then salinity shown here in light blue. Um, yeah, so you can see what which of the variables is driving that mess. Uh, implementation, again, is the same as with MESS. Uh, it's automatically calculated anytime you run MAXENT and do a transfer. Um, you can also calculate it independently using the MESS function in mod EVA R um, because this is something that's actually calculated the same time you're calculating MESS. 
uh, one potential problem with MESS is that it can have equivalent MESS scores, but for different variables. So it may be that the MESS scores in one area are being driven by something like salinity, whereas they're being driven by something like uh, temperature or something else um, in another area. And so uh, we may be getting a very different picture of what's going on. And it may be that more than one variable uh, is driving that um, model extrapolation, but we can't really tell. And so uh, Owens et al. in 2013, that paper I already mentioned, what we did was we wanted to address that issue. Um, and so we developed this movement-oriented parity or MOP metric. And so what that does is it calculates the multivariate environmental distance from each cell in a map to the cloud of points in the training region. The multivariate environmental distance metric that we use to calculate the distance from this point to the set of points of interest is called Molinobis distance, which you will see again. And that's basically um, a measure of the distance from, this, from any point to a set of additional observations um, given a correlation matrix. So basically, it's a way of measuring the distance from one point to a series of points, given that uh, the relationships among variables are correlated, which in the case of niche modeling, they certainly are to one degree or another. Um, so the user specifies the training region of points um, that are closest to the cell of interest to you that are but they're being used in that calculation. So in this case, you have mean temperature on the x-axis annual precipitation on the Y. All of these dots are uh, combinations of variables in the geographic area of interest. Uh, any dot that's circled in red is, an, is a combination of variables that exists in the training region. Uh, this dark black dot is a particular cell for which we want to calculate the movement-oriented parity score. Uh, and all of these blue dots are ones that are selected um, to calculate the similarity to the training region. And in this case, um, if you specify 100%, that's saying that's the full training region. And so it's approximately equivalent to what uh, MESS is comparing um, when it does that calculation. Um, and so... Again, it's calculating the multivariate environmental distance from each cell to the cloud of points in the training region. Um, so that's shown in this map now, uh, the MESS scores. So areas in black are strict extrapolation. So that's saying these are areas where there's most definitely extrapolation happening. Uh, areas shown in blue are the most similar to the training region. Areas shown in red are the least similar. Um, and so if you specify a 1% MOP, so that's saying you're only comparing each cell to the 1% closest uh, set of points in the training region. Um, potentially not surprisingly, that's going to give you something that's the most similar to M. So it's only looking at that closest edge. 10% uh, you get some more similarity being calculated. 50% uh, and 100%. So that's again approximately, it's comparing the same amount of the training region as uh, MESS. But you can see that um, MESS and MOP end up with a little bit of a different conclusion as far as what is the most dissimilar. So, for example, uh, you can see in North America you have a MESS that is much higher along the northern edge than along the southern edge. Whereas if we are doing a multivariate comparison, instead of focusing on that most extreme variable, um, we actually get a much different picture. So the, the Rockies end up being the most dissimilar um, and then sort of the, the Great Plains area being the most similar. That's looking at the distance from each cell to uh, all of the variables that are used in the training region and not just uh, the most extreme value. Uh, the last set of comparisons I wanted to discuss is uh, extrapolation detection, or XDET. That would, this was uh, a series of metrics that were proposed by Mescaron et al. in 2014, which I already mentioned. 
Um, and so what this is doing is it actually distinguishes between type one novelty, uh, what I referred to as strict extrapolation earlier, and type two novelty, which is also referred to as combinatorial extrapolation. And so this is a, a graphic from their paper. Um, so in this case, uh, species uh, shown in red uh, circles are, uh, those are actual occurrence points. Um, and so any areas in, or any points shown in black are areas of strict extrapolation. So they're occurring outside of uh, the combination of variables that are used to train the model. And dots shown in blue are uh, combinatorial extrapolation or type two extrapolation. Um, what XDET does is calculates a univariate distance from each cell uh, in the map of the training region that you want to determine uh, to what degree there's extrapolation occurring. Um, calculates each cell to the values used to train the model. So similar to MOP or MESS. Um, but what it does is it sums up the distances for all of those variables to determine a strict, a strict extrapolation index. Uh, and this is the formula here. And if you want more details on the formula, I recommend the paper. It's very clearly written, um, so you should be able to figure that out. Um, and so once you have that N1 index, uh, you can then calculate ex uh, combinatorial extrapolation, or N2, as well. So if NT1 is zero, so there's no, co there's no strict extrapolation, you then move on to NT NT2 for your cell. And that's the ratio of Molyneux distance of a cell of interest to the maximum Molyneux distance within the model training data. Um, and so that's the area. In this case, they uh, developed a model for this species in southern Australia and then projected it worldwide. Um, any areas shown in red are type 1 novelty or strict extrapolation. And then areas shown in blue are type 2 novelty or combinatorial extrapolation. So... Uh, a set of variables that are um, outside of the combination of variables used to train the model. And similarly to um, MESS, it also calculates this most influential covariate, MIC. Uh, in areas with strict extrapolation, this is the same as um, MOD, which we've already talked about. So it's, yeah. But then in areas with combinatorial extrapolation, MIC is the variable whose exclusion causes the most extreme drop in Molyneux distance. So it's actually able to calculate um, this most extreme variable even in areas with combinatorial extrapolation, whereas MESS is only calculating them uh, for areas with strict extrapolation. And so this, you can see that this plot looks rather similar to uh, the mod plot that I showed earlier, although, of course, for a different model and in a different region. And the implementation for this, there are two options. Um, so first, there's a standalone GUI application, which you can download uh, from this website. But I will note that it's only available for Windows machines, unfortunately. Uh, the good news is that there is also an XDET function in the density modeling slash DSM extra R package. So if you want to experiment with that, um, you have a couple of options. So again, to summarize, um, the different extrapolation metrics that I've talked about. Uh, the first is multivariate environmental similarity. So this is very common, especially uh, for folks that have used Maxent to do their uh, model transfers. And what it does is it calculates the minimum of univariate sim similarity scores. Uh, Movement-oriented parity, on the other hand, is a Molyneux distance from a cloud of points in a training region. So it's saying, okay, from... Uh, the distance from one point in multivariate space to any of the other points in multivariate space that were used to train the model. And the last set is extrapolation detection, which differentiates between different kinds of extrapolation. So it's got one metric for strict extrapolation, which is the sum of univariate distances, uh, which is somewhat similar to MESS, although a little bit different. And then combinatorial extrapolation, which is the ratio of Molyneux distances um, between the cell of interest and those used to train the model. And because extrapolation can be such an issue when you're doing model transfer, there are a lot, there's a lot of interest in developing uh, more and better metrics 
to determine where extrapolation is occurring and how extreme that extrapolation may be. So some further reading, if this is a topic that's of interest, um, I recommend that Elith paper that I mentioned. Uh, there's also a Zural paper that came out in 2012 that has some very nice, uh, clear explanations. Uh, the paper that I and colleagues did in 2013 and that Mescaron paper from 2014. And that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you for listening and uh, good luck with your extrapolations in the future.